Hello, fellow explorers. Join us for our weekly rendezvous with intriguing stories. Find a cozy spot and let's unravel the mysteries and joys awaiting us. Ready? Let's begin. Story one. My straight mom fell in love with my teacher. Throwaway account for family and friends who usually use Reddit. For some context, my dad passed away when I was young in a car accident, exactly when I was four. So she tried hard to make sure we had a good life. My mother worked in various places until she got a well-paying job, which is the one he currently works on. We both grew up in a somewhat conservative area where homosexuality, not that it wasn't frowned upon, there were LGBT people and they were completely accepted, but there were families who didn't like the idea of homosexuality too much. My mother grew up with that mentality. She didn't hate the LGBT idea, but she certainly disliked gay couples a bit. One time we saw a gay couple in a mall and she said something like, they shouldn't do that in public, much less kiss. During my childhood and adolescence, she had several boyfriends. Her longest relationship lasted almost five years. I really liked the guy because we used to play Monopoly and various video games. Luckily, we still talk because he's one of my mother's best friends. But they both decided to take different paths and had to separate. Now, or months ago, a year ago I started going to a gym near my house. She began to notice my physical changes. It crossed her mind to go to the gym with me. Until several months ago, he started going to the gym. After thinking about it a lot, after months she lost a lot of weight and improved physically. I noticed several guys from the gym looking at her carefully. Something that made me laugh is when she shows off her six-pack to me, and how now she says she doesn't need me to open the jars or jam or pickles anymore. In September, she signed up for the spinning class with the other ladies. At first, she only went in the morning, but after four weeks, she also went in the evenings. My mom told me that she had become friends with Jennifer, the spinning teacher, not her real name. Some weekends, she let me know that she was going out to eat or run with Jennifer. This is how their relationship continued. There were times when my mother spoke with Jennifer for several moments on the phone or on WhatsApp. I began to suspect my mother's feelings towards Jennifer when one day they went out for a run, but it started to rain. I heard from the noises that they came running and stood next to the roof on one side of the entrance. I looked out my window and saw them both outside the house. Jennifer and my mother were laughing and I saw my mother's face completely red and nervous like when she was with her boyfriend before. Jennifer's face was the same as my mother's. Then they gradually stopped their conversation and looked at each other. I saw my mother look Jennifer in the eyes and then shift to other parts. They both started to get closer and for a moment I thought they were going to kiss, but they both stopped. At that time, I was sitting in my room looking out the window. Through my window, you can clearly see the entrance to my house in the garden. Then my mom and Jennifer came home. I greeted them both. Jennifer and my mom looked a little uncomfortable, and then Jennifer left. I asked my mom if something had happened because her face was red. She flatly denied it and asked me not to talk about it anymore. More things happened. My mom and Jennifer's outings increased and tended to last longer. And the times my mother couldn't see Jennifer, she got a little sad. But something happened at the end of November. A person we know left his girlfriend for another guy. As soon as we found out, my mother talked about it privately, declaring how that was possible. What example was that for the children? That she would never have a relationship like that, and basically saying bad things about LGBT people. Hearing her say this made me a little sad for her situation, because clearly my mother had feelings for Jennifer, but she didn't seem to want to accept it. Four days ago, I went out with friends to watch a movie. My mom was going to be home because it was her day off. I told her that I would be arriving nearby in the evening. But things happened, and I had to return home early. When we arrived, my mother's car was not there. So I just went to my room and played some video games. Shortly after, I saw her arrive with Jennifer. I heard some strange sounds, took off my headphones, and walked down to the stairs carefully. And I saw my mom and Jennifer hugging each other. I saw that my mom was sobbing. They both moved away, and then my mom kissed Jennifer, and she did the same. I returned to my room, being very careful not to make any noise. Five minutes passed, and I heard them leaving. They both kissed again and got into the car together. And in case you were wondering, I had all the lights in my room off. The only thing that was on was my computer. About an hour passed, and they both returned with Walmart bags of paper, gift bags, and toys. My mother always gives toys to my nephew or the children of her friends, and yes, they were for them. My mother and Jennifer greeted me, and between the three of us, we wrapped the toys with paper and other th others in the bags. When Jennifer left I, left, I asked my mom, not directly, if something was going on between them. My mother got nervous and denied it completely. For now, my mom has not seen Jennifer because she went to spend the holidays with her family like us. 
At the moment, I can't feel happier for my mother. It seems like she's already admitted what she feels, but she hasn't told anyone. I'm going to try to tell her that I know by showing her all of my support and love and that I don't care if she's actually gay. The only thing that matters to me is seeing her happy. <sighs> I'm very happy to hear that. I was worried that this story might have a bit of a negative bend to it or something, but it uh, it's good to hear that this person is supportive. And I feel for that mother because... Um, I grew up in an area and a time where uh, being anything but straight, it wasn't like, you know, like, there weren't people, like, attacking us. It didn't feel too oppressive, but it also didn't feel okay. I come from a town, a lot of churches, a lot of old-fashioned thoughts, and so it was tough, and I'm just 40. Who knows where this person grew up and, you know, what age they might be, but... The further you go back, the less that stuff is accepted and the harder it is to break out and accept yourself. I didn't accept myself as pansexual until I was 26 and I'd moved out of that town to a bigger city and had like supportive friends who helped me to get to that spot and also get away from the church that I had been a part of. And it's really difficult for some of those people to shake that stuff. Like if this mom had grown up with that belief, you know, just ground into her for who knows how many decades, it's going to take some time to shake it off. And I don't know what exactly the right way to approach them about that is, but I think this person's doing a great job, just showing all the support and love that you can. Story two. Today I effed up by giving my friend's girlfriend underwear. Okay, so let me start off by saying that I'm 19 and a trans man. I've had no surgery, nor no hormone treatments. I usually just wear a binder or heavy clothes. So I still have periods, and my whole life I've been taught to carry extra supplies on me. This includes underwear, so I do that. I buy packages of brand new panties and put them into little baggies with pads in them just to make my life easier. And because occasionally I give a package away to a friend who's in need. Due to an incident in high school where a friend of a different size bled through and was stuck waiting half an hour for her mother, I now carry pre-made packages with different sized panties that don't fit me. My friends in high school knew why and the girls loved it. Some even gave me money to buy supplies like pain meds, pads, or their sizes. Now in university, I have two groups of friends, a group of guys and a group of gals. This is mostly because both groups do different things as hangouts and, well, I enjoy both things. The guys don't enjoy shopping trips, and for the most part, the girls don't want to go to the arcade. So, one day, a guy's girlfriend, let's call her Sasha, joins the girl group, and she knows I'm trans and everyone got along pretty well, and one day my friend Emily sends me a text which was basically what we call an emergency text, or aka, I'm in class, can't text long. The message was simply, Sasha, building A, floor 1. I left my class and ran over and could hear her crying. Sasha is pretty sensitive and her periods are bad. When I got there, I asked her if she bled through. She confirmed she had gone through one layer. I said, okay, now this is a weird question, but bear, bear with me. What size do you wear? When she answered, I pulled out one of the packages and tossed it under the stall. When she finally got out of the stall, she thanked me, hugged me, and went back to class. I forgot about it after that until the guys sent a group text asking to meet up. I met up with them at lunch, and Sasha's boyfriend immediately said, Why are you carrying around a crap ton of panties? I kind of paused for a moment and asked for clarification, and he told the guys how instead of calling Sasha's mom, I gave Sasha's panties like a weirdo. I explained the situation and why I had everything, and that some of these packages were for me. I reminded him that I'm transgender and still have a period myself. His response was that he got that part, but he doesn't see why I'm carrying around panties for his girlfriend. This is where I really effed up, by saying I had packages for all the girls in the girl group. This further upset more guys who also had girlfriends in the girl group. I tried to explain that for two of them, Emily and Ashley, their parents dig through their bags and even remove stuff. I don't have that problem, and that for Janet, she has to carry around three books every day and has no room in her bag, well, I only have a laptop and have room. Apparently this made things worse, and so now none of the guys are talking to me until I stop it. Apparently, they don't like that I know their size and what panties their girlfriends are wearing. The girls are also now peed at their boyfriends and are debating ways of attempting to fix this situation because they feel bad that I'm in the middle of this fight that they think should be between them and their boyfriends. 
Well, here's what you do. Uh, you just throw them a nice little insecurity parade. You can dance around and talk about how insecure they are about something that's none of their business. <laughs> Seriously, why do they have such a problem with you having this, like, you know, caring role among people who are dealing with periods? Something that these other guys are going to know nothing about. Like, they should be looking at this and going, wow. They're really taking care of each other. What a wonderful, nice thing. I wish we did that more. But no, they have to be like, no, uh, how dare you? How dare you care for other people and provide them comfort in times of distress and everything? This is just, being so caring, it, it disgusts me. Get over yourself. Yeah. Story one. My husband is reluctant to be intimate with me after I was in a major accident. I, 30 female, have been married to my husband, 45 male, for five years and together for eight. Obviously, we have an age gap in our relationship, and whenever we discussed poss possible health issues or medical care, it was regarding him. About four months ago, I was in a car accident. I was talking on Bluetooth to my husband because I was nervous driving on the icy roads going to our house when another car rounded a corner too fast and lost control. It was one of those exact wrong moment things, and my car went off the road and into a tree. My husband heard the whole thing, and my last memory before I lost consciousness was him screaming my name. I don't want to get into the bloody details, but I ended up being in the hospital for over a month. I needed multiple surgeries and have been in physical therapy ever since. I'm finally getting to a point where I feel like myself again and am no longer in pain. I've gained back some weight and look good if I do say so myself. My husband literally worked out of my hospital room for the entire time I was there. He went home to shower, sleep, and look after the dogs, then came right back. He attended all my therapy appointments so he would know how to better help me recover at home. He was amazing, and everything I could ask him to be in that kind of horrible situation. I love him so much, and so yesterday, while shopping, I saw this gorgeous black lingerie set and decided to surprise him. We haven't had intercourse since before the accident, and every time I try, it feels like he makes an excuse or expresses some concern about some random body part of mine that's no longer injured. He was on his laptop in bed when I came in wearing my new purchases, and I could tell he was taken by surprise. I basically crawled into his lap and started kissing his neck and grinding on him. He was definitely hard, but then he lost it and pushed me away, saying that we shouldn't rush this and he doesn't want to jeopardize my recovery with intercourse. I was crying by the time he ended the sentence and said, I'm fine, the doctor says intercourse is fine, but he was already walking into the bathroom and turning on the shower. I don't know what to think. Is it the scars? Is the memory of me in the hospital bed unable to even sit up by myself repelling him? I finally am starting to feel good about myself and my body again, and the fact that he won't touch me is really hurting my mental health. It's probably a long shot, but has anyone else experienced this? Well, I have not. Um, the, the best advice I think I can give in this situation is to sit him down in a situation that isn't, you know, that intimately charged and talk to him and express your feelings like, hey, the fact that the doctor says I'm okay to have intercourse and you're pushing me away is really messing with my head. It is making me feel completely undesirable and I am becoming depressed over this. And if he is having like certain issues because of the accident that's making him worry, maybe you can start slow. Maybe you, maybe he needs to talk to a therapist. Maybe you need to do a couples therapist. Who knows? It sounds like he is probably just kind of nervous about all that. I don't know. Uh, hopefully it's not that he is, like, turned off by the scars and everything, because if that's the case, that sucks so much. But it sounds like he's a pretty caring, loving person, so hopefully this is something that just some open, honest communication in a non-charged environment might be able to rectify. Story 2. The day I was hired and fired by a law firm. So, this was about five years ago. I worked as a chef at a bakery. It was my job to make everything but the baked goods. Every morning, the baker and I would walk in at about 4 a.m. and knock out all the food needed for the day. This would leave me ready to go home around 10 a.m. or so. This puts us at the perfect time to deliver online orders. It was common for companies or other entities to place large catering orders with us. The baker and I would split them down the middle and deliver them on our way home. 
The delivery in question was for Bob, Dick, and Harry, attorneys at law. I have never delivered to BD&H before, but they were regular, of sorts. Every financial quarter, they would hold a huge meeting. This meeting would require roughly $700 of bagels and bagel accessories. This spread included eight dozen bagels, all ten of our flavors of cream cheese, pastries, brownies, and enough coffee to pour a college dorm through final weeks. My passenger seat, entire back seat, and entire trunk are filled with food. Now, BD&H is located on the ninth floor of a commercial skyscraper deep in an industrial complex downtown. Parking was non-existent. There were meters outside the building, but I knew I would need close to ten trips to deliver all this food and didn't have a lot of change on me. Company policy was to just pay whatever fines I needed to park and then turn in my receipts. The money would end up on my next paycheck. So the building has its own parking garage, so I pulled in. The security card, let's call him Sam, stops me and says that the parking garage is for employees only. I happily show him my delivery invoice and offer him a bribery bagel. Never leave the store without at least two. Sam refuses the bagel and says I can park in one of the guest spots on the bottom floor. The fee is $5 for every 30 minutes, minimum $10. I thank him and head to the bottom floor of the garage, so there are a total of six guest parking spaces. Just six. All of them are taken. I head back up to talk to Sam when I see an open parking spot reserved for Bob, Dick, and Harry, attorneys at law. There are cars in every spot, with many spots being reserved for employees by name. The last spot is empty and is reserved for guests of BD&H. Perfect! I pull on it. I grab the most important part of the delivery, the coffee, and head to the stairwell. I get into the elevator and hit the button for floor 9. The elevator asks for my employee ID card. Well, crud. So I tried the lobby. That works. From there, it's nine flights of stairs until I'm outside the law firm of Bob, Dick, and Harry. After introducing myself, I'm shown to the room where the meeting will take place. A table is set aside for me. I set down the coffee and headed for trip number two. That is when I see Sam talking to the receptionist. He runs over and starts shouting at me, I am putting a boot on your effing car! I told you to park as a guest on the bottom floor! I don't get a word in before he launches into a speech about security and how I could be hurting his building or people. That is when a very well-dressed man walks over. It so happens to be Bob, the Bob of Bob, Dick, and Harry's. Bob asks, what is the problem? And soon the two are arguing. Bob. OP is delivering food for my meeting. He's allowed to use my parking spots. Sam. Those parking spots belong to the building. You're leasing them like you lease this floor. I am the one who says who can park there. He isn't an employee, so he isn't parking. Then I'm making him an employee. Y you can't do that. You know what? You're right. Harry, Harry, get over here. Harry walks over with an amused look on his face. Harry here is the head of our HR department. Uh, Harry, hire this boy. Harry pulls out a piece of paper and scribbles, OP is now a member of Bob, Dick, and Harry's, and signs it, then asks me to sign as well. I do. Bob reaches over to the receptionist, who's already grabbing some things. Here's your employee badge, your parking permit, and your elevator key card. Now please do the job I have hired you to do and deliver my bagels. Sam looks on in utter fury as I ride the elevator down to my car. Seven sweet, sweet elevator rides later, all the food is delivered. Bob and Harry meet me at the table. OP, you've uh, made great strides in this company and I'm proud of your work, but I feel it's time for us to part ways. Here is your final check. Bob then hands me a crisp $50 bill. And your severance package. Now please be sure to return your badge and uh, card on the way out. Harry hands me a $20 bill and sends me on my way. The receptionist is sure to validate the parking ticket that Sam gave me, and I head out. On the way out, Sam grins at me and asks for my ticket. I place it in the machine in his station, I sees the validation I got, and lets me out for free. Sam glares at me as I drive off into the late morning sun. Hey Sam, either you're very bad at your job, or the people who hired you and trained you, or own the building, are very bad at their job. The fact that this person is doing a delivery and you're saying they can't use the guest spot for the people they're delivering to is wild. It's absolutely bonkers. As someone who used to be a delivery driver for a bakery in Northeast Minnesota and on occasion had to deal with someone kind of like you, though not nearly to that extent, I want you to know just how many people don't like you. 
hate you, really. Um, and I'm sure that you're aware of this, and I'm sure it wears on you and makes you the crabby person that you are. You're probably crabby at home, crabby with your kids, just complaining as you go and have drinks with your friends. And you know what might make you feel better? What might improve your whole life? Is if you just stopped being an a-hole. Story 1. I, 28 female, am getting tired of my boyfriend, 28 male, getting upset over inoffensive things that I say. I'm presently on a walk trying to blow off steam. My boyfriend has a habit of getting offended by something I say. Last week I said, my friend Sam wants to hang out with us soon. He wants to get to know you better. He's a good guy. We had a day-long fight about it because he said I went on and on about how Sam is a great guy after we had intercourse. It had been 20 minutes or so, but we were in bed talking, and that made me upset. We had a day of fighting where he accused me of not being sensitive enough, and I accused him of reading too much into a single sentence. This is not the first time it's happened. We've been dating for eight months. We're a long-distance relationship for a while, and had maybe five fights in that time, six months. The last two months we've lived together, I'm in another country and he came to live with me. Last night he was talking about when he goes back to his home country, he'll have to find a place, etc., and he doesn't know if he'll find temporary housing. I suggested he get an apartment and break his lease. I have had to do this before and will do this next year, as a matter of fact. It sucks, but that's how crap works and we just gotta put up with it. This has turned into a day of us fighting with him accusing me of taking him for granted, taking his job flexibility for granted, he can work anywhere, not caring enough, not being sensitive enough, you name it. That one sentence apparently had a lot of meaning to him when I was just trying to offer up some suggestions. I explained my side, listened to him, agree with him on some points, and apologized. He continued to go on about how I don't appreciate him. This is a theme in our fights. I say something wrong, he gets upset, he insults me without calling me a bad girlfriend outright, gets mad that I get upset, then says he can't tell me how he feels and how it's always his fault and paints himself the victim. I'm livid. I've done so much for him and have been nothing but grateful he's moved here for me. I never asked him to. He wanted to. And he wants to come back in a few more months when his tourist visa is up. He has always been the one saying he has the money. His job is flexible. He wants to be here. Now he accuses me of putting pressure on him. Because of that one sentence. I need insight. I need perspective. I need advice. Please help. It sounds to me like either this boyfriend has some serious self-confidence issues that he needs to kind of work on, maybe talk to a therapist about, and maybe you can help him out with that if he's willing to confront that, but, like, this is really kind of out of control, or he's manipulative, and I don't want to necessarily go down that path, what I'm seeing here, it's not enough to go off of, but there are some people who will constantly make themselves look like the victim and turn anything into a little fight as a way of manipulating someone else. And that is a bit of a red flag that he's going off so much about these things. But I would try to have just some open, honest discussions with him. Like, look, I'm not trying to make you so upset, but you are blowing a lot of these things out of proportion. What is it I'm doing wrong? What can we work on? Maybe you'll come to some conclusion, but I don't know. That is pretty pretty out of control. Story 2. Need me to send in proof of my name change? Fine, enjoy your jammed fax machine. So, I was granted a legal name change a few months ago. Long, boring story as to why. Simply put, hated the unique spelling of my first name and wanted to ditch my surname. Didn't have much trouble updating my name in most places. Social security, driver's license, insurance, yada yada. No bumps in the road until I got to the very last thing to update my credit card. I use this particular credit card a lot. I'm self-employed and use this card to rack up travel points for flights, hotels, rental cars, etc. However, if you've ever checked into a hotel or picked up a rental car, you know the name of the card must match the name on the ID. So I called the credit card company, told I have to fill out a certain document and mail that in alongside a copy of the court document. Fair enough. Two weeks go by, hear nothing, so call again. They say they haven't received it. I then inform them, I'm then informed they have a fax number that I can use to send in the document. So I fax in everything necessary using an app on my phone. After two weeks go by, still nothing. 
I called again. Same spiel on the other end of the phone. Please mail or fax. You get the deal. I once more did what they asked, yet another week passes. I call again, told the same damn script. I'm starting to get annoyed by this point. I have an upcoming trip planned and need the card to match my ID, so I asked to speak to a manager. They give me some BS of a manager not being currently available. Anyways, I fax in the document and court order once again. However, this time I decided I was just going to keep hitting send after the previous one had shown as delivered. I thought I'd repeat the process a few times just to make sure they got it. After sending it 25 times the first day, I got no response. Next day I was sitting on my couch watching football. Thought I'd send the fax a few more times. By the time I realized how many times I'd hit send, I had sent it over 130 times. The very next afternoon, I got a call from a manager at Credit Card Company. She sounded quite angry over the phone. I just played dumb. You guys asked me to fax it in. I got my updated card in the mail three days later. Can we all just admit that the vast majority of credit card and financing companies absolutely suck? They suck so bad, and they will try to find just any reason to make you miserable, I think, just to somehow try and, like, get, like, fees out of you for being late on something or doing something wrong. Like, the way they are run is infuriating. And I don't say this just because I've recently been dealing with one and, like, oh, yeah, your auto payment's set to go through. Uh, here's, here's a reminder in your email. Your auto payment's about to go through for your monthly payment. And then I get a notification a few days after my payment was due, like, Oh, your payment's laid. Why don't you just set up auto payment? And I go in there and it shows, oh, the auto payment's all set up for next month. I asked, I just, I can't stand them. I'm not blaming the employees or even necessarily some of the managers and stuff. I think the companies are just built to be torture machines to squeeze money out of people. And I hate them. Story one, nightmare situation. Me, 35 female with partner, 40 male my son, and his nephew, 15 males. Four years ago, I met Bob, 40 male. Bob had recently become the guardian of his nephew, Ben, after the death of Ben's parents in a car accident. Ben is the same age as my son, Jason, 11 at the time, now 15. At first, it seemed perfect. I was over the moon at finding a man who was not put off by the prospect of taking on a soon-to-be teenage stepson. Jason's father was not in the picture. And in spite of being very different personalities, the boys got along from the beginning. So Bob and Ben moved into my house within less than a year. Ben was always a quieter, more creative kid, where Jason is more athletic and boisterous. And from the start, I got the sense that Bob understood Jason's way of being more than he did Ben's. At first, he would take them both to sports games, but Ben obviously had no interest, and so pretty soon he just took Jason. At the time, it seemed like a natural choice. Ben was bored at the games, and Jason honestly reveled in having old Bob's attention. But after that, things started unraveling. As they grew older, the difference in the boys became more obvious. Their choices of clothing, hairstyle, friends, music, hobbies, etc. And so did Bob's preference. He started making little comments comparing them and encouraging Ben to be more like Jason. At first, it seemed like he was trying to be helpful, thinking that Jason's way of being was healthier. He was more outgoing, has more active social life, etc., because that's what he remembered from his own experience. But after a while, there was clear snideness there, which it was impossible not to hear. My son has always had a strong protective streak slash sense of fairness, and in spite of their differences and the late age they were introduced, he and Ben are very close. So Jason's reaction to Bob's remarks favoring him was to take Ben's side. He stopped going to games with Bob and generally liking him, and for a while became openly hostile on Ben's behalf. That stopped once he and Bob had a major argument. Jason backed down at that point because, he told me, he realized that if he kept making himself unpleasant, Bob and I might break up, in which case Ben would have to leave too. Since then, with a few exceptions, he has been coldly civil. Meanwhile, Bob has come to believe Ben is gay based on what I consider spurious evidence, not that it matters to me whether he is or not. He wanted to send him to a military-type reform school, and when I vetoed that, his behavior toward Ben escalated to a subtle kind of downright nastiness. 
Needless to say, all of the above strained Bob's and my relationship to breaking point, and then broke it. Seeing his ongoing behavior towards a child who needs him, I can no longer look at him with anything but disgust. The thought of him touching me makes my skin crawl, and I desperately want him out of my house. We're not married, and it's still in my sole name, thank God, but now I have the same problem Jason was worried about. If I end the relationship and kick Bob out, Ben will have to go too, since... Legally, I have no tie to him, whatever. He's 15 now, and although he has borne everything by stoically ignoring Bob, I can't in good conscience let that man be solely responsible for him. For what it's worth, I've always tried to stick up for him and get Bob to see that there are many types of boys in the world and all of them are equally okay. Not to mention I don't think Jason would ever forgive me if I did. I would happily take guardianship of Ben if I could, even if Bob made no financial contribution at all, we could manage if we cut back on luxuries. My concern is that I'm far from sure Bob would agree. However he personally feels about Ben, Ben is still his flesh and blood, and Bob feels strongly about that. To be honest, I think it's part of the reason he resents Ben so much. Ben is the last of the line, and not turning out how Bob thinks his family should be represented. If I were to start a conversation along those lines and Bob refused to allow Ben to stay, it would be incredibly difficult to roll back. The idea of having to continue to play his supportive wife to stop him leaving of his own accord for another two and a half years till Ben turns 18 sounds like a nightmare. But the alternative is worse. What is the best way to manage and get through this? <sighs> this is a heartbreaking story because, yeah, clearly Bob has kind of an old-fashioned mentality about what a boy can be, you know? It's perfectly all right for boys to not like sports, to be, you know, a little more reclusive, to, to all that kind of stuff. And, man, uh, I don't know. I, I just, I don't know how this is handled, but I, I don't believe that this person should have to stay with someone in a loveless partnership, you know, but... I don't know. I'd say the best thing would be is to maybe talk to a lawyer first and see like, hey, if we break up, even though he has guardianship, do I have any case? Is there anything I can do or file that might get me custody of Ben when I break up with Bob? <laughs> because I hope there is. Story one. My best friend, 22 female, is giving up a full ride scholarship to be with her boyfriend of less than three months. Throw away for anonymity reasons. My best friend has a full ride scholarship, tuition, rent, books from our university. She's a very book smart girl and has been on the dean's list almost every semester. This is our third year of college. The issue is that she is a gullible person. Even though she's book smart, she will get caught up in things like multi level marketing schemes. She'll date older men who take advantage of her. Many things like that. While she was home over the summer, she and her old high school crush, 20 male, started hanging out. At the end of summer, he officially asked her to be his girlfriend. I like the guy and think he's better for her than her past flings, but they're getting very serious very fast. Last month, she told me she was thinking about transferring to his university. I told her that was ridiculous, as she would give up her scholarship and have to take out loans. Turns out, she applied to transfer anyway. Today, she got her acceptance notice and couldn't be more excited. I've already told her this is a bad idea, but she is so gullible. And her mother is the same way. Her mom thinks this is true love. Two small town lovebirds crossing paths again. My roommate keeps saying that this is just like her parents' romance. And she needs to give this relationship everything. Oh, her parents are divorced, by the way. Is there anything I can say or do to help her reconsider? I've already voiced my opinion once, and it didn't do anything. I know that this was written in the past, and I'm so upset knowing that this person probably went through with it and gave up her scholarship to go to the same university as this high school crush boyfriend. And I'm so upset. Don't! Do that! Please! Especially if you're already in your third year, you, you've already got so much college under your belt. They're paying for everything. Do you not know how expensive college is right now? My god! Why? And this is coming from someone who 
little little hint for you here. I gave up going away for college because of my high school sweetheart that I was still seeing. You know, I was 18, 19 at the time or whatever. Uh, and I could have gone out to a university. I had a number of them after me. I had, I had my ACT score was, I don't know, 32 or something. Like, I had a lot of good offers. And I stayed and I went to community college. And I just picked a major that I wasn't even that interested in. And I ended up dropping out. And we broke. It was just a mess. Please don't do this. If the per if it's love, if it's real special magical love, you could deal with the long distance. You'll find each other afterwards. I promise you can still have your fairy tale ending, but also without all the debt and a maybe a better degree. Please don't do this. Story two: No refunds once you've stepped out of the store. Fine, I won't step out of the store. This happens in a large store in a European country. When you purchase something from them and for any reason want to return the item, their policy is that they never give money back. They only give you a voucher redeemable the same day only. I went to the store today and purchased quite a long list of items. When I got home, my wife looked at them and said that we don't need some of them. I go back to the store, barely 20 minutes pass. The returns manager smiles at me as I tell her I just purchased these and would like to return them. She tells me that I stepped out of the store so she can't get a refund. Only give me a voucher and I must buy something else. I'd already bought everything I needed. Then she tells me to take the products home and keep them for the next time I would need to buy something. Then I can come and get the voucher and redeem it. Imagine keeping a pair of shoes and a bowl and remember to bring them with you the next time you happen to need something. I tried to reason, but she was adamant. Those are the rules. You stepped out of the store. You didn't get a refund. And then it clicked. I asked, so if someone wants to return an item without leaving the store, they get the money back, yes? You see where this is heading. Malicious compliance kicking in. I asked to return the items and get the voucher. I take the voucher, get inside the store, find a product for exactly the same amount, buy it with the voucher. Right after the cashier, there's the returns manager. Straight from the cashier, I go to her. Hand her that random product I just bought and say, I would like to return this. I don't want it. And I never left the store. She looks at me with barely contained rage in, your, in her eyes. I kid you not. The awkward pause was getting longer. And then her manager comes along, looks at us, and I smile at him and say, I never left the store and I would like to get a refund for this, please. He nods, silent and not looking at me. She proceeds to refund me the money in cash. Company policy, right? Look. I can understand why some stores have more strict return policies, because there are a lot of folks out there, uh, people who are going to try and abuse this system and always get their money back. I, I worked at a Walmart once. I've seen people returning big screen TVs the day after the uh, Super Bowl, so it happens, all right? Um, and yeah, if a store is going to have a non-standard return policy, I'm typically fine with that. And you better make that so abundantly clear to each and every customer. If you're going to have a return policy this strict, and this is an unusually strict return policy, which I'm fine with, but if you're going to have it, then as you're checking them out, just know, by the way, just remember our return policy is once you've left the store, it it cannot be returned for cash. Only an uh, in-store voucher used that day. You say that every time. You have at the bottom of the receipt printed in big bold letters, return policy, no cash back, you know, whatever. You, it is the, the onus is on the store to make that very clear. People can argue with me. I don't care. I've worked for a store that had a super strict return policy, but we were very clear. The whole back wall behind the cashier, like genuinely, I think we measured it and it was 30 feet tall was the return policy in these huge block letters. It was on the receipt and as cashiers, it was a rote thing that we would just recite with every purchase. I'm okay with it then and only then. Story one, my brother admitted to a prank that drastically changed my life seven years ago. 
Seven years ago, when I, 17 male, was preparing for college at 17, I was trying to find scholarships. I applied to a scholarship run by a local family using money from a man in the family who was very wealthy. They eventually announced that a girl from our town had won, and I thought nothing of it. My brother's 27 male is now in AA and is making amends. He admitted to me that I won the contest. He said that an old teacher of his was on the scholarship board and saw him at the store and brought it up to him assuming we knew. But we didn't know as the letter hadn't come in the mail yet. But after she said something he knew, and when the letter came, he took it. He was mad at me at the time, now he doesn't even remember why, and says that he responded to the letter thanking them but telling them I had received a full ride scholarship to the school of my choice and no longer needed funding. He gave them his own cell phone number and said they could call him with any questions. He said they did, and he just convinced them I didn't need the scholarship and they should give it to someone else, so they did. He admits it was crappy of him, but still doesn't seem to think it was a big deal. He doesn't even see the value of the money lost because I still got to go to college, but the difference was that I ended up $40,000 in st with student loan debt. I still owe $35,000 and the interest is counting. The scholarship would have paid out a total of $45,000 over the course of my college education as long as I maintained minimum grades. His prank cost me tens of thousands of dollars. I know he's in AA and the goal is to make amends and fix relationships, but this honestly makes me w never want to see him again. I spent college so incredibly stressed over money, and this could have solved so much of it, and he did this over something he can't even remember now. Where do I go from here? Am I supposed to let this go? Sorry this is kind of a rant, I don't really know what I'm asking other than just general advice of how this should affect my relationship with him. I feel like I don't want any relationship with him at all, but now I might regret that years down the road. I think the thing that you should be basing how you approach this on is how he treats this. Because if he truly wants to make amends, the thing he needs, like, obviously you're probably not going to get $40,000 out of him. Even more with the interest, because student loan interest is absolutely stool, stool, it, it, cruel, it's out of control in this country, my sympathies. But the fact that he still doesn't see it as that big of a deal, that is why you can still absolutely be upset and not want to speak with him. He's not making amends by just admitting to you that he cost you 40000 dollars because He's not actually apologizing if he's just like, yeah, I did that. It was a crappy thing to do, but it was just a prank, you know, no bit. Like, if he cannot admit like, yeah, what I did cost you an unreasonable amount. And while I can't give you the money, I will do whatever I can to make this right and make amends. If he's not willing to do that, he's not making amends. He's just not, in my opinion. So yeah, be mad at him and let him know like, hey. When you're ready to actually apologize about this, we can talk. Until then, I'm kinda done with ya. Story 2. Shady Boss lied about my position to keep me from policy-allowed benefits for years. A few years ago, I worked at a big retail company and had for many years. Eventually, I went through enough grad school education to get my license to work at a higher level. Much more pay, more job satisfaction, more responsibilities, fancy titles, but the job market was rough. I stayed on with the company to work in a floater position where I would cover a large area and work at all the stores within that area on a rotating but irregular basis. Eventually I wanted to get a staff position where I have a single store assigned. The area was huge, the furthest store being over 100 miles from my home, and that is exactly where I was assigned to train for the new role. It was a tough store. Folks in my position were robbed and assaulted at gunpoint. The neighborhood was very unfriendly, volume at the store was among the highest in the state, staff turnover was, as you might expect, extreme. Well, after training, I wasn't really being scheduled to float to other stores. Once a month, at most. I asked to be scheduled a little more diversely since most of the stores in my area were much closer to my home and didn't require four hours of driving a day. 
Bossman told me that I was the only floater experienced enough to handle that store. I didn't buy it, but what can you do, right? Well, a colleague told me about the mileage reimbursement policy. Floaters working at a store more than 50 miles from home can file for reimbursement of mileage over that 50 miles each way and can even include meals. So I filed a few of those out and sent them to my boss to sign. He didn't quite refuse, but he never actually signed and filed them. I suspect as soon as I left his office at our district center, he tossed them out. Bossman tells me later that they must be lost in the system. Eventually, the same colleague showed me how to fax those same forms to accounts payable bypassing the district boss man, so I started doing just that. One day, boss calls me in a panic. He wants me to stop my filing the forms. I ask to be floated closer to home, but he won't budge. He needs me at that miserable store. He promises me he'll make me a staff role at that store if I promise to stop faxing those forms. Staff roles are a promotion and usually come with better pay and a few other little conveniences, so I agree. Bossman says there won't be a pay bump right away, but that it'll come down the road. That never happened. Two years later, the situation at the store has become too toxic for even me. I asked to step down from the staff position to be a floater again and to be allowed to float to other stores. Bossman says that I'm already a floater, never was in a staff position, but that he can't let me work at other stores because it's better for me and the customer if I stay there for familiarity. Floaters do not get scheduled to stores exclusively, so I'm being singled out because they're still desperate to cover that dump of a store. I'm livid, so I start looking. It took me months, but eventually I found an opportunity to make my dream career transition. I put in my formal notice, and that's where the fun started. Remember that whole mileage reimbursement policy? Well, I kept meticulous track of all my shifts, and there is no statute of limitations baked into the policy, so I started filling out those reimbursement forms to retroactively cover every single shift from the past two odd years. I skipped the meal part since I didn't want to go through all that effort of finding receipts. I had a friendly store manager sign off on them, and I started sending them to accounts payable directly again. I didn't fax them all at once, but for each shift in my final two weeks, I faxed a few dozen in. We still have fax machines in that line of work, believe it or not. I figured, what do I have to lose? Worst case scenario, accounts payable declines the forms. On my last few shifts, I started getting the checks from accounts payable. Not added to my paycheck, but sent to me directly. Mileage reimbursements are non-taxable income, so this was all tax-free money coming to me. It must have taken a while for the charges to show up on a balance sheet because a few weeks after my final paycheck, I got a call from my now former boss man. He wasn't happy. He got some big loss prevention manager involved and together they started saying I was breaking some rule by requesting the payments. They specifically claimed I was ineligible because I agreed I wouldn't be eligible in a staff position. They then threatened legal action against me if I didn't remit the full amounts back that same week. But... I had the email chain from when Bossman said I was never staff and always a floater. I politely referenced that email chain before letting them know firmly that because I was lied to, our prior agreement didn't apply and I was fully eligible all along. Corporate policy, as confirmed by HR, agreed with me, so I let them know I wasn't returning a single penny. In the end, the reimbursement amounted to well over 21,000 US dollars, and I transitioned into my dream job. I could say that I would trade that money back for the time I lost commuting to that miserable store four hours every shift, but all that pressure motivated me to make the best career move of my life. The great satisfaction of not only professionally surpassing my old boss, but getting to tell him that his lies cost him way more on the way out is almost priceless. I also shared my story and method with many colleagues who were being told wrongly by the boss man that they didn't qualify for this policy. Ah, another bad boss that I genuinely and truly hope lost his job over this. I hope he lost his job and was blacklisted from, you know, getting another job for a while in that same field. And God, I hope he's never anyone's boss again. Because what he did was awful. Making someone drive four hours a day and then trying to deny them mileage reimbursement? The fact that he's not in jail for that just shows how absolutely wacky this whole system is. I can't stand people who take advantage of others 
especially to that level. Like, yeah, losing his job should have been the bare minimum of what happened. Please leave your story in the comments. I would love to make a video on them in the future. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe.